The members of this 21st century Bedouin caravan, one of the few still operating in Mesopotamia, are probably unaware they're walking on land that, centuries ago, belonged to a great people, the Aramaeans. In the course of centuries, this ancient race has left an indelible mark on world history. Today, it is as if the memory of this people has been lost in the mists of time. In a land that has nurtured hundreds and hundreds of years of history, in which the Aramean heritage has played no role. Nevertheless, enclaves of Aramaeans live on, a few still clinging to their roots in the Middle East, the majority dispersed in communities scattered all over the world, and all brought together by their church, the Syrian Orthodox Church, that has recorded their heritage and preserved their language. The term Aram appeared for the first time in the 23rd century BC to indicate a region of upper Mesopotamia where this nomadic people had settled. The history of the Aramaeans, a Semitic people which traces its lineage to Aram, son of Shem, Noah's fourth son, has its roots in ancient texts including the Old Testament and the Quran, a heritage confirmed by recent archaeological finds. The Bible tells of Abraham, the wandering Aramean, from Ur of the Chaldees in southern Iraq, who settled for a long time with his family in the region of Aram Naharaim, meaning the Aram of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, specifically in Haran, in the southeast corner of modern Turkey. Later, when Abraham wanted for his son Isaac a wife who was not from the land of Canaan where they had finally made their home, he sent his servant back to Haran. The servant found Rebekah, daughter of Bathuel the Aramean, son of Milcah, wife of Abraham's brother, and consequently, the patriarch's great niece. When the servant first set eyes on her, she was fetching water at the well, a daily chore that continues today. Tell me, my child, who is your father? Can your father give us shelter for the night? I am the daughter of Batul, the son of Milcah by Nako. We have no lack of straw and hay, and our home is a roomy house to lodge in. Later, when it came time for Isaac's son Jacob to marry, Isaac followed his father's example and gave his son this order. Go to Padan Aram, the house of Batul, the father of your mother, and take from there your wife from among the daughters of Laban, brother of your mother. Jacob did as he was told and found three shepherds minding their flocks near a well. My brothers, where are you from? We are from Haran. Do you know Laban, son of Nakor? We do. Is he well? Yes. Oh, that's his daughter Rachel approaching with the flock. Jacob kissed Rachel, a shepherdess like those still found today near Haran, and told her they were related because he was Rebekah's son. Therefore, he was an Aramean, just like her family. Abraham the Wandering Aramean brings us to 1850 BC, but it is only in around 1100 BC that the first explicit mention of the Aramaeans appears in the annals of the king of Assyria, Tiglath Pileser I, in which are recorded battles against the Alamu Aramean nomads along the banks of the Euphrates. I forded the river Euphrates 28 times and followed the Aramean people from Beshre to Tadmor, from the city of Rafik in Babylonia to the city of Anat in the region of Suhi and to Gargamish and to the east of the plains of Srug. It was here that Dura Europus was founded as a river port and defensive point against attacks from Mesopotamia. This ancient city, founded in the 4th century BC by Seleucus, Alexander the Great's lieutenant and head of the Seleucid dynasty, was for a long time not only an impregnable fortress that defended the kingdom of Syria, but also an important trade center on the caravan route that linked Mesopotamia to the Arabian Gulf and to Antioch, the ancient capital of Syria. Captured and razed to the ground by the Sassanids in 256 AD, the city, or what was left of it, 
was buried under the sand for 1,700 years. Today, Dura Europus is one of Syria's most important archaeological sites, a veritable trove for archaeological finds and a constant source of precious information that serves to reconstruct the history and the customs of people who, like the Aramaeans, inhabited this area even before the city existed. The citadel of Dura Europas overlooked the majestic Euphrates, along which the Aramaeans founded various city-states. Some are named in the Old Testament, Aram Soba, Aram Bitrehob, Padan Aram, Aram Damascus. Others, such as Bit Adini, have been passed down from Assyrian sources. At the end of the 10th century BC, the Assyrian Empire started its expansion towards the west and gradually conquered the neighboring city-states that, until then, had maintained their independence. This is why documents regarding the Aramaean civilization are often found in Assyrian Babylonian archaeological digs. In 1979, at Tel Fekiria, just south of the Turkish-Syrian border, a great statue came to light. It is now in the Museum of Damascus and dates back to the 9th century BC, when it was erected by a certain Hadad Izi, a Syrian governor of Gozan for the Assyrians, king of Gozan for the Aramaeans, in honor of the god Hadad, lord of the water in the heavens and on the earth that brings richness, creates pastures, and irrigates all the land. On the tunic, is a long inscription in the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian and in Aramaic. The Akkadian text is inscribed in the place of honor, the front, while the Aramaic text is relegated to the back. Hadad the storm god was one of the most important divinities worshipped by the Aramaeans. He is sometimes depicted brandishing thunderbolts, as on this stele in the Louvre in Paris. Hadad Izi of Gozan was not the only Aramean king to have left a relic that has come down to us intact. In the Museum of Aleppo, at the foot of a likeness of the god Melkart, an inscription attests to it being the statue that Bar Hadad, king of Aram, erected out of gratitude to Melkart, his lord, who answered his prayer. A longer inscription, also at the Louvre, was inscribed by Zakir, the king of Hamath, in thanks for a victory over 16 other Aramean kings. The god who gave him that victory was Baal Shamayin, Baal, the lord of the heavens, who could be the same god as Hadad. The longest of the ancient Aramaic inscriptions preserved in the National Museum of Damascus is, however, a treatise between a certain Bargaya, perhaps a high official of the Assyrian king himself, and Matiel, the king of the Aramean city-state of Arpad. In the text, Bargaya lists a series of curses against Matiel should the agreement ever be broken. Matiel is dishonest in the dealings. Let his kingdom become a kingdom of sand, a kingdom of dreams that dies like a flame. Let Hadad hurl his wrath and all sorts of disasters on the earth and in the heavens. Let him send hail unto Arpad. Let the locusts go mad for seven years. Let not a blade of grass grow that one can see neither vegetation nor green pastures. Let not the sound of a lyre be heard in Arpad or among its inhabitants, but only moans of desperation, crying, and lamentations. Aside from the inscriptions, there exists other proof of these Aramean city-states, such as the stone sculptures unearthed at Gozantal Halaf on view in the Museum of Aleppo. The delicately sculpted ivories from Hadatu Arzlantash in the Museum of Aleppo and the Louvre. Fresco fragments from the mid-8th century, also in Aleppo. 
the frontispiece of the Temple of Haddad in the National Museum of Damascus. The Aramean city-states, whether independently or as a group, engaged in recurrent conflicts not only with the Assyrians but also with the Israelites. Like the Assyrians, the Israelites were defeated several times by the Arameans, who in turn were several times defeated by them. Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt are the countries that still today preserve the memory of the ancient Aramean civilization, often only in place names. First and foremost, the Aram Naharain, the Aram of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Mesopotamia of today, the cradle of the Arameans. Then Padan Aram, the field or highway of Aram. Arpad, Bitadini, Amku, Nisibin, Edessa, the Valley of Orontes, the Valley of the al Bikka, Koba Betrehot, the Valley of the Litani, Hamath, Sam al Gozan, Damascus, the sites in which the Arameans played a key role from the 11th to the 8th century BC. in an endless succession of wars among themselves and against outside enemies. Then, in 732 BC, the Arameans were finally defeated by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III. Damascus was destroyed. Its last king, Ratson II, was killed, and the territory was broken up into provinces that were annexed by Assyria. Damascus will cease to be a city. It will become a collection of ruins. Its neighborhoods will be abandoned forever and will become grazing land. I will set fire to the walls of Damascus and it will devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And the people of Aram will become slaves. Thus, the biblical prophecies came true. From that moment onward, the dispersion of the Arameans began. Without a land of their own, they were condemned to wander over the course of time to the four quarters of the world. Nevertheless, in their own way, the Arameans actually conquered the world, not with arms and the might of their nation, but with a far more effective instrument, their language that has survived through the centuries and has come down to us in the liturgy of the Syrian Orthodox Church and the other Syriac churches. The inscription on the famous 9th century BC statue of Haddad is the oldest surviving document of the Aramaic language and evidence that in around 1000 BC, the Arameans adopted the Phoenician alphabet composed of 22 letters. They used it without adding as much as one character, even though the phonetic system of the Aramaic language was much richer than Phoenician. Long before conquering the Aramean city-states, the Assyrians realized that it was much faster and more practical to write in Aramaic rather than Akkadian, the accepted language of the day. Akkadian contained an unwieldy number of characters compared to the 22 letters of the Phoenician Aramaic alphabet. In addition, Aramaic could be written with ink on skins or on papyrus, while the cuneiform Akkadian required a stylus which impressed the wedge-shaped characters onto soft clay tablets. Because of its simplicity and rapidity, Aramaic soon became an international language used in official documents, in diplomatic reports, and in commercial transactions. 
In the second book of Kings, the ministers of King Hezekiah, in order to avoid being understood by the people, ask the emissary of the king of Assyria, please speak to us in the Aramaic tongue so that only we can understand you. One hundred years later, a Philistine king wrote in Aramaic to the pharaoh of Egypt asking for military help to stem the advance of the Babylonian army. Paradoxically, after 732 BC, the year of the defeat of the last Aramean kingdom, the language of the defeated people became a universal language. Easier to write than Akkadian, and with instruments that were easier to come by, it was a kind of shorthand compared to the complicated Akkadian that remained a language for scribes and scholars, while Aramaic became a popular language used by all social classes. Thus, in due course, Aramaic spread throughout a vast area from Asia Minor and Afghanistan to Egypt and North Africa, reaching as far as India and leaving many traces of its presence. In Jordan, the spectacular site of Wadi Musa, or the Valley of Moses, is a prelude to the fascination of Petra, the capital of the Nabataeans, and another source of evidence of the Aramean presence. We pass through the Sikh Gorge, following one of the many canals dug out of the rock as part of a complex irrigation system for which the Aramean Nabataeans became famous. It leads us directly to the Pink City, as Petra is called, in reference to the color of the sandstone from which, one might say, it is sculpted. Aramaic, written in a distinctive local script, was the language of the Nabataeans who flourished from the 1st century BC to the 1st century AD. They carved their capital out of the living rock. In truth, Petra was a stronghold, located strategically on the main route between the north and south of the Arab Peninsula, traveled by caravans with precious loads of incense and myrrh from Arabia, spices and silks from India, ivory from Africa, and precious skins. From this well-protected, dominant position, it was easy to raise tolls, to demand exorbitant sums for food, shelter, and stabling, and to play a key role in the commerce between merchants and caravaneers. And, of course, it was easy to plunder, too. Thus, the Aramean Nabataeans became rich and powerful. Then, in 106 AD, the Romans incorporated the kingdom of Petra into the Roman Empire, making it the capital of the new province of Arabia. This led to the development of new caravan routes, slowly diverting trade away from Petra and causing its decline. The Nabataeans' own dialect of Aramaic has survived in inscriptions on the pediments of buildings and temples, on rocks and stones, at the base of votive capitals, and on the walls of gullies. In the latter case, the writing is in the guise of implorations to the gods to avert disaster in the event of flash floods that would race through the gorges, sweeping away everything in their path.
a garden of 500,000 palm trees and the imposing vestiges of what was once a large Roman city in the middle of the desert are the most remarkable characteristics of Palmyra, the ancient Tadmor in the heart of Syria, another hub of the Aramaic linguistic area. As in Petra, traces of the Aramaic idiom that used to be spoken here can still be found. The extraordinary story of this city features, among others, Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, one of the greatest women of ancient times. Beautiful, noble, ambitious, a charismatic leader, and an indefatigable horsewoman, Zenobia addressed her people in Aramaic, wearing a helmet and purple robes. For a short period, the armies of Palmyra even managed to seize control of many of the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. This was in the day of the Emperor Aurelian, who eventually managed to capture Palmyra and take Queen Zenobia prisoner. Since very early times, the oasis was inhabited by the Aramaeans, and here, people spoke Aramaic of Palmyra. Traces of that language can be seen on the Roman colonnade along the main road. Beneath the inscriptions in Greek are the same words in Aramaic. Qabura dina abad bil hazai bar buraiki bar bil hazai Today, in the local museum, the voice of a scholar reading those Aramaic inscriptions as though they were current idiom gives the impression of being caught in a time warp. Hatra in Iraq was founded in the 1st century BC and was destroyed by the Persians early in the 3rd century AD. More than 300 Aramaic inscriptions have been found here, some in the Aramaic dialect of Hatra. Many are of great historical importance. Most of these inscriptions are now preserved in the Museum of Mosul and in Baghdad, together with statues and other relics found at the site. By the second half of the 5th century BC, Aramaic had become the most widespread language in Palestine, as everyday documents inscribed on pottery indicate. In 1947, at Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea, a Bedouin boy looking for a goat that had wandered off entered a cave untouched by time and stumbled upon what is probably the most important archaeological find ever made in the Holy Land, a terracotta jar containing the oldest group of scrolls ever discovered of biblical and non-biblical manuscripts. It was the first of a series of such scrolls that subsequently came to light in 11 caves, an unprecedented treasure that continues to fire the imagination and polarize the interest of scholars around the world.
One of the first and best preserved of the scrolls contained the Book of Isaiah, copied many centuries earlier than any other surviving manuscript of this book. The Isaiah scroll is written in Hebrew, but another one contains an Aramaic translation of the Book of Job. From the Jordan to the Dead Sea, from Judea to Galilee to Samaria, from Syria to the Negev to Sinai, Aramaic was the language of the people, and therefore also the language of Jesus and the Apostles. When he addressed the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the apostles and disciples who constituted the Church of Jerusalem went out into the world to spread the word of God, speaking the only language that they knew well, Aramaic. So they left and preached everywhere, while the Lord went with them and confirmed the word with his great works. Antioch, today Antakya, on the Orontes River, was the capital of the Roman province of Syria and the third most important city of the empire after Rome and Alexandria. No wonder that it was one of the first places visited by the messengers of the new religion. After consolidating his role as leader of the apostles, Peter lived there for a year with Paul and Barnabas, and together they gathered many converts. The inhabitants of Antioch were sometimes skeptical and often hostile. But here, the church accepted non-Jewish converts, and for the first time, its congregation became known as Christians. The echo of those days seems to permeate the air around the ancient church cave on the outskirts of the city, where it's believed that Peter preached when he was in Antioch with Paul. The Crusaders added the facade at a time when Antioch was an important Christian base in Syria, but the cave still looks as it did in its primitive state. Originally, it was owned by the evangelist Luke, a native of Antioch, who gave it to the Christians so that they could have their own place to meet and pray together. Today, it's impossible for Christians not to be overwhelmed by the emotion of being in a place that has been sacred since the dawning of their religion. For many tourists, the main attraction is the passage dug from the rock and used, according to tradition, to lead the faithful to safety in times of danger through a maze of inaccessible overhanging caves. The cave church of St. Peter is still used. Pilgrims come here now and then to attend the solemn rites, unchanged by time, celebrated on special days, like the visit of the Patriarch to Antioch at the beginning of the third millennium. For the most part, these pilgrims come from abroad, insofar as the local Christian community is now, unfortunately, almost non-existent. While the new religion was burgeoning in Antioch, another of the Twelve Apostles, Thomas the Doubter, set off across the ocean heading for India. After a long and hazardous voyage, he finally set foot on the subcontinent's southernmost shores. And so, thanks to Thomas the Apostle, the Church of Christ gained a foothold in that remote area. And with the church came the Aramaic language. In the place where tradition has it that the Apostle first encountered the native people, some rabbis who came out to greet him, 
the scene is reconstructed with life-size models. Nearby are the remains of an ancient Hindu temple, transformed into a Christian church after the conversion of the local people to the gospel announced by Thomas. Centuries later, following in the Apostles' steps, Christianity spread to the center of southern India and Asia along the Silk Route. More often than not, this expansion was accompanied by the spread of the Syriac language. A long Chinese Syriac inscription on a stele erected in Xi'an, in ancient times known as Xinyanfu in western China, bears witness to the arrival in 635 AD of a Syriac mission there. Additional evidence comes from a Syriac manuscript of the Gospel written with golden letters for a Mongol princess at the end of the 13th century that contains a portrait of the princess herself with her husband. Our quest to retrace the history of the Aramaeans takes us back to the biblical city of Haran in Upper Mesopotamia, one of the oldest centers of habitation in the world and the cradle of the Aramean population, the land of Abraham. And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Aran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. This is Haran today. The current inhabitants are unaware of their Aramean ancestry and barely remember the name of their biblical ancestor, even though he is rapidly becoming the town's main tourist attraction. Not far from Haran is Urfa, or Shanli Urfa, glorious Urfa as it is known today, a large city lost in the middle of nowhere, 50 kilometers from the Syrian border. Originally, it was known as Edessa, and it is steeped in history. Subject to the mysterious laws of military alchemy, great empires fought each other for centuries in this hot, dusty location that continued to be a theater of dispute between leading historical figures almost until the present day. The people who live here now are anything but aggressive. In the cool, relaxing park, pious Muslims gather to throw chickpeas to sacred carp. The fish are sacred because legend has it that at the funeral of the patriarch Abraham, who was a great prophet for the Muslims, the sparks from his pyre turned into carp when they hit the water. The entrance to the so-called Cave of Abraham is always crowded with pilgrims. According to a local legend that contradicts biblical history, this is the birthplace of the prophet Abraham, friend of God. Shanliurfa is a melting pot of races and ancestries, Turks, Arabs, Kurds and foreigners. The souk is emblematic of the ethnic mix.
A cacophony of voices speaking in many different languages, but one is missing, Syriac, the Aramaic of the Syriac Christians who lived here for centuries. Two columns known as the throne of Nimrod, the biblical founder of Edessa, stand out against the sky on the kale, or fortress. On one of the columns, one can still see an inscription in Syriac recording the name of Queen Shalmat, who was a member of the local royal dynasty which established itself in Edessa in the late 2nd century BC, and whose line of kings lasted until the early 3rd century AD. It is said that Abgar VIII, known as the Great, converted to Christianity in the year 206 with the majority of his subjects, and thus the city became the world's first Christian kingdom. This is more legend than history, but it is very likely that the new religion reached Edessa at an early date, making it one of the most important centers of early Aramaic-speaking Christianity. As a result, its local Aramaic dialect, Syriac, became the language both of the Syrian Orthodox Church and of the other Syriac churches of the Middle East. Today, however, there are no signs of a Christian presence. The Christian population here, as in many other cities and villages of Upper Mesopotamia, was forced to migrate, or more precisely, to flee from the hatred and persecutions that, in 1915, even took on the characteristics of genocide. The last Christian communities left in 1924, spurred on by the massacres, and took with them all they were able to save from the dismantling of their churches, furniture, relics, holy books. Everything was transferred to nearby Aleppo in Syria, where they were warmly welcomed and have been able to continue professing their faith in peace. That's why traces of the early Christian community of Edessa can be found in St. George's Church in Aleppo. In the atrium, a modern base relief depicts the Aramean king of Edessa, Abgar V, known as the Black, who reigned many years before Abgar the Great. The king is depicted gazing at a linen sheet bearing the image of Christ. Tradition has it that Abgar the Black admired Jesus' miracles and sent a messenger asking him to come and heal a terrible illness from which he was suffering. Jesus answered that as soon as he ascended to heaven, he would send the king one of his disciples. When the messenger returned, he showed the king the effigy of Christ that Jesus himself had miraculously impressed onto a linen sheet, and the king was healed.
Three keys are required to open the safe that contains the still intact holy books that belong to the Edessa community. Lay members of the church keep two of the keys and the bishop keeps the third. Among the precious manuscripts in the safe is the Chronicle of Michael the Syrian, Mor Mikoyel Rabo, dating from 1199 AD. Syriac became the literary language of all Christians of Aramean descent, both in the Eastern Empire and farther east in the Sassanid Empire. Syriac had its own translation of the Bible, the Peshitta, still used today. And in the course of centuries, Syriac has generated a vast amount of literature by many important authors. Saint Ephraim of Nisibin, in particular, is one of the greatest poets of the early church. It was he who coined the phrase, the hidden pearl, to describe the Christian message. These Aleppo school children are reciting one of St. Ephraim's poems. It is as though their voices have crossed the border into Turkey, traveling to their ancestral home of Nisibin in search of the memory of Mor Ephraim the Syrian. Mor in Aramaic means Lord, Monsignor, or Saint. Until a short time ago here in Nisibin, known today as Nusaybin, an inscription was to be found on the walls of this church, recording the date 359 AD, which means that Saint Ephraim himself might have seen it being built, since he was still living in Nisibin at the time. We searched for the inscription in vain in the church dedicated to Saint Jacob of Nisibin, another great Syriac saint that welcomed us in the empty silence of its splendid desolation. Aleppo's new cathedral, one of the countless Syrian Orthodox churches dedicated to St. Ephraim, the remarkable modern frescoes are influenced by the rich Syriac culture, whose greatest figures were Bardaisan, known as the Aramean philosopher, who died in 222 AD, the poets Balai, Narsai, and Jacob of Seruj, along with authors such as John the Solitary, 
Philoxenus of Mabuch, Sergius of Reshaina, and John of Ephesus, all belonging to the 5th and 6th centuries, followed in the 7th century by such men as Severus Sebokht, Jacob of Edessa, and Isaac of Nineveh, or Isaac the Syrian. These were followed in later centuries by great scholars such as Mushe Barkifo, Dionysius Barsalibi, the Patriarch Michael the Great, and culminating in the polymath Gregorius Barrebroio in the 13th century. Included among these illustrious figures, naturally, is Saint Ephraim. Late antiquity, especially from the 3rd to the 5th centuries, was a period of hermits, ascetics, and monks. The remote, often inaccessible places that these mad followers of God inhabited seem impossibly inhospitable to us in the 21st century. These men cut themselves off intentionally from the rest of the world, and the only way to find traces of them is by following goat tracks. This is Wadi Kadisha, the Lebanese Holy Valley, where there are many remains of Syriac monasteries and hermit dwellings that blossomed during that age of great mystical fervor. However, these men, who were commonly referred to as the recluses, did not embrace a life of extreme sacrifice out of an abstract love of God, an elitist need for isolation, or an egotistical life of contemplation. In 313 AD, the Edict of Constantine sanctioned the end of the persecutions and marked the beginning of freedom of worship for Christians. Being a Christian was no longer synonymous with imprisonment, torture, and death. But many members of the church yearned to belong to the world of martyrdom of the early Christians. They yearned to be martyrs themselves, determined to sacrifice their lives in order to bear witness of their faith. This is why they made their heroic choice and subjected themselves to what was widely considered absurd hardship and deprivation. A hermit monk wishing to found a monastery would choose a cave big enough to contain a church. The presence of a freshwater spring nearby was indispensable. For several years, such a monk would live alone in the cave, praying and awaiting the arrival of fellow monks who would join him of their own free will, together with others who responded to his invitation. When the group was big enough, everyone worked together to build the church. Subsequently, the monastery would be built. Each monk was assigned his own cave, some accessible only by rope or ladder, in which he lived a life of prayer and solitude until the end of his days. Every Sunday, the monks gathered in the monastery to take the Eucharist, to receive orders from their superior and to collect a ration of bread, water, and oil. Each monk might also have had a goat to provide milk and cheese. When they were old or ill, monks too weak to reach the monastery would be assigned younger monks who would see to their needs and nurse them until their final hour. Ikos Ayas, once a Syriac monastery, is still inhabited today. It contains a typical example of a cave church. The cave seems to offer a protective embrace and, in some places, is incorporated into the building itself.
A few other active monasteries can still be found in this part of northern Lebanon known as the Mountain of the Primitive City and today called Wadi Kadisha or the Sacred Valley. There are three dioceses of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Lebanon. The Diocese of Beirut, the Diocese of Mount Lebanon, and the Diocese of Zahle. Together with believers from different countries, the faithful who live here often visit the Holy Valley, following in the footsteps of the countless pilgrims who have passed through here over the centuries on their way to the Holy Land. One of the most popular destinations is still the monastery of Ikos Ayas and its original place of worship dedicated to Saint Anthony, who was considered a specialist in healing mental illnesses. Curiosity brings many tourists here to see where the mentally ill were healed long ago, and the high caves where the most dangerous cases were held in chains. But most visitors come here to express their faith. Entire families will light a votive candle and pray together, to give thanks for answered prayers or to ask for grace, to pray for the health of a family member or for the success of a project. Barren women pray for children and unmarried women pray for a husband. Examples of simple devotion that always demand respect. From Lebanon's Beka Valley, it's not difficult to reach Ferzol Mountain, with its rock face punctuated by six levels of pre-Christian cave tombs that were taken over centuries later by Syriac monks and transformed into dwellings. Evidence of a pagan past is everywhere, in symbols of Phoenician divinities, and in cells where bloody sacrifices were offered. Visitors can almost identify with the spirits of those who, for love of Christ, chose to live as recluses in these tombs. Dominating the upper reaches of the Orontes River in the Beka Valley is the Cave of the Monk. Originally a monastery, this group of caves was used by crusaders as a fortified lookout point. The vaulted ceiling is darkened a smoky black by torches and fires kept constantly alight to protect the cave's inhabitants from the merciless cold of the long Lebanese winter. Those who make the climb up here are rewarded by the simple signs of devotion that refer not to the Crusades but rather to men whose eyes looked heavenward, men who chose to live in these austere caves during their earthly lives. Below are the springs that give life to the Orontes River. In Aramaic, the Orontes is called Alazi, the Rebel River, because an optical illusion often gives the curious impression that it flows uphill the river flows in a wide arc through three countries, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. 
Ever since ancient times, it's been harnessed to power water wheels and still serves irrigation canals that turn arid, unfertile land into rich soil. The Orontes River divides in two Antioch, the city of the evangelist Luke and of the first Christians, and after a total course of some 390 kilometers, it empties itself into the Mediterranean. The waters of the Orontes symbolize the vital lifeline that runs from closed monasteries, hermit dwellings, and holy springs through tortuous, mysterious canals to reach the entire community of believers. Jubaddin, a Muslim village tucked away in the mountains of Kalamun to the north of Damascus. Everything here is similar to innumerable other Muslim villages. The architecture, the way people dress, the way they live. But there is one fundamental difference. Arabic is not spoken here. The people speak Aramaic, or rather, 
a dialect of Aramaic related to Syriac. Indeed, the inhabitants of this Syrian village are direct descendants of those Aramean peoples who, many centuries before Christ, inhabited Upper Mesopotamia and then moved south to lay their roots throughout the Middle East, from Turkey to Iraq, to Syria to Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Islam is the faith of these people who hold in honor Abraham, the wandering Aramean, as the Bible calls him, the great prophet, the friend of God, and their direct ancestor. And they guard their Aramaic dialect jealously. Over 3,000 years ago, their ancestors used the same language. It is a source of wonderment to hear people chatting about everyday matters in this age-old language that has been passed down orally from one generation to the next for over three millennia. Right now, the subject of discussion is an upcoming feast day. The final word, as always, will be spoken by the Mukhtar, the village chief. The songs are in Aramaic. Even modern songs are translated from Arabic into the ancient language that parents teach their children, who in turn will teach their children and grandchildren. Ma'alula, another small town to the north of Damascus, where Aramaic is also spoken. The name has Aramaic roots. Ma'alula means entry. This time, the inhabitants are mainly Christian. Ma'alula and its surrounding area is in one of the oldest inhabited parts of the Middle East. Stone Age man lived here some 50 to 60,000 years ago. The area is strewn with caves once used as sites of worship or burial or, when necessary, for defensive purposes. The way they're laid out would allow a handful of men to resist the attack of an army. One example is the inaccessible cave known as the Fortress. 
Another enormous cave called the castle could hold up to 1,200 people. One of these caves, originally a place of burial, houses traces of the first Christian settlements dating back to before Ma'alula was developed outside the caves. A cross and a bird, possibly a pelican, the symbol of Jesus. A vandalized carving of the Virgin and Child. A peacock that symbolizes immortality, a Greek inscription that refers to Christ's victory over the pagans and a symbol of the Trinity. Apart from the name, additional evidence of the growth of the Aramean community in Malula can be found in local traditions and in the day-to-day -day conversation of its current inhabitants. <laughs> In the course of the centuries, the Aramaic language was divided into various dialects, Nabataean, Palmyrene, Mandean and Syriac, in addition to the dialect spoken in Jubaddin and Ma'alula in the Kalamun Mountains. In the highest part of the village is a typical Malula house. It's the home of a 105-year-old woman, a shrine for the memories, emotions, and illusions that have filled her long life. She talks about them in Aramaic, the only language she knows, and one of the few things that have never changed for her. After the Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan in 313 AD, communities like Malula emerged from the safety of the caves and gained importance as centers of Christianity. Indeed, some Christians felt encouraged to destroy pagan temples or transform them into churches. The Monastery of St. Sergius above Malula is an extraordinary example of this kind of transformation. The doorway is so low that non-Christians and Christians alike are obliged to bow to enter what is considered to be one of the oldest churches, not only in Syria, but in the entire world. The Lord's Prayer recited in Aramaic by this girl is a familiar sound for these ancient stones and the centuries-old woodwork. Probably built around the year 325, the year of the Nicene Council, the church is a visual representation of the transition from ancient paganism to the Christian Revolution. That transition is physically embodied in some of the wooden beams that scientific tests have shown are over 2,000 years old. And by a pagan altar with a hole through which sacrificial blood would drip to be collected in jars. This means that parts of the building date back to before Christ. 
For some people, the use of pagan elements in a Christian church might be considered sacrilegious. But to believers free of prejudice, it's a sign of the deep change that occurred in the hearts of men with the advent of Christ. Legend tells of a Christian girl called Tekla, whose father, a pagan and perhaps a king, wanted to marry her off to a pagan officer. While trying to escape from her father's soldiers, Tekla found her path blocked by a high rock face. The girl prayed to the Lord to give her an escape route. Suddenly, the rock face split open to reveal a passage that became known as St. Tekla's Gorge. The gorge became the girl's home, and after her martyrdom, St. Tekla was buried here. Every day, pilgrims from all over Syria and from other countries visit the monastery sanctuary of St. Tekla in Malula that houses the saint's tomb and relics. Saidnaya is another Syrian town that, before the arrival of the Greeks and Arabs, was inhabited only by people of Aramean descent. The Aramaic heritage is reflected by the town's ancient name, Danuba. Like Malula, evidence of prehistoric Saidnaya lies in caves where pre-Stone Age objects have been discovered. The town's recorded history began in the indestructible monuments erected by the Greeks during their 400-year occupation. The Christian tradition is evident in the many local churches and monasteries, the most important of which is dedicated to Our Lady of Saidnaya. Built 1,500 years ago, it was known as the Fort due to its impregnable defensive position. This monastery sanctuary is visited daily by tourists and pilgrims of different faiths, including Muslims. The monastery and sanctuary are looked after by nuns of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, to whom Christians of the Byzantine Church who speak Arabic answer. The nuns are also responsible for restoring antique icons and safeguarding a veritable treasure trove of ancient manuscripts. Although these are now in Arabic, in the Middle Ages, Saidnaya was an important center for the copying of Syriac manuscripts. These are only some of the books from the monastery's original library. Many more have been burned, stolen, or destroyed by the ravages of time. In the reliquary, the icon of the Blessed Virgin, called Shagura in Aramaic, meaning the famous one, is surrounded by an incredible collection of ex voto offerings that reflect the gratitude of countless beneficiaries who come from many different countries and many different sectors of Christianity. of this Christian eclecticism can be found in the life of St. Simeon Stylites. Simeon was born in Cilicia in 390 and later moved to Syria. After subjecting himself to intense acts of contrition and mortification, he moved to a mountain near Aleppo. Here, he built a column on which he lived and preached ceaselessly to ever-growing crowds of people who flocked to him in hope of his blessing or to be healed. The name stylite, from Greek stulos, meaning column, 
was given to his followers who became known as stylites. The base of his famous column is still visible today in the monumental remains of the church named after him at Kalatsiman, or the citadel of Saint Simeon. The column was 36 cubits or 15 meters high and from its summit the saint healed, solved disputes and preached social justice until his dying day. The historian Theodoret, Simeon's contemporary, wrote that pilgrims to the saint's column came from many different countries, Ismailites, Persians, Armenians, Georgians, Himyarites from southern Arabia, as well as Spaniards, Britons, and Gauls. The existence of different faiths was not important to the saint. To him, all that mattered was God. Keep your own faith, he used to say. Just leave me my God. That's why at Kalatsiman, we often find the Syriac cross alongside Greek, Byzantine, Latin, and Maltese crosses. These symbols of different Christian traditions are a concrete indication of St. Simeon's eclecticism. Dotting the countryside around Kalatsiman are the remains of nearly a thousand villages and towns that prospered between the first and seventh centuries AD and then fell prey to a series of economic crises, wars, invasions, and natural disasters. These are the famous dead cities of Syria's northern limestone hills. Here, even place names conjure up pictures of utter desolation. This valley is called the Valley of the Wind's Door. There is evidence of burgeoning spirituality everywhere, particularly in the remains of imposing churches. Along with financial prosperity, the inhabitants once enjoyed a rich religious life founded on their Christian faith. But now, all that is history. A walk through the ruins and rubble of what were once architectural jewels and centers of Christian spirituality is a sobering experience. Among countless examples of the extreme degradation is the baptismal font of the Church of Mushabak, today used as a watering trough for sheep. The once magnificent Byzantine church of Kalb Lause, that means almond heart, is another example of past splendor. Fortunately, in modern Syria, the idea of persecution or even religious discrimination is absolutely foreign. Perhaps one day, this extraordinary Christian heritage will be safeguarded in the measure that it deserves. It's a priceless treasure for Syria, as well as for the rest of the world.
At Al Ruzafa are the ruins of the Church of Saint Sergis. The Bedouin tribes of Syria, many of which were Christian, were particularly devoted to Saint Sergis and often visited his sanctuary in Rusafa. Here too, there is evidence of the ancient Syriac liturgical rite, for example in the characteristic bima, the dais in old Syriac churches from which the priest read the holy books. The Aramean heritage of the Syrian Orthodox Christians is also rich in traditions tied to the liturgical calendar. These are celebrated with great enthusiasm and much ceremony and include a contest held on Palm Sunday during which people try to touch the holy palms carried in procession by the bishop. And the washing of the feet ceremony on Holy Thursday that takes place here at the archaeological site of Kalat Simam. Sadat is a small town in central Syria. In the solitude of the Church of St. George, a group of girls practices an Aramaic song, the most beautiful and simple of prayers taught by Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. There's an underlying element of melancholy in this simple religious melody, as in all the songs and melodies belonging to the Syriac Christian musical tradition that expresses so well the endless suffering and hardship that this oppressed people has had to bear. The walls of this church, like the walls of the churches of St. Sergius and Bacchus in the same town, are decorated with ancient frescoes depicting scenes and people related to the Christian tradition and to the Syrian Orthodox Church in particular. The simplicity of the images is immensely moving. A description of each figure and each scene is given in elegant Syriac writing. A large number of ancient manuscripts and holy books written in Syriac is preserved here. Deplorably, the congregation treats with great familiarity priceless books that warrant a greater sense of preservation. Kamishli in Syria is a border town created by the Syrian Orthodox Christians who had fled from nearby Turkey in the face of persecutions that destroyed their villages, burned their fields, and transformed their churches into mosques. Just beyond the national border is Turabdin, which means Mountain of the Servants of God. 4,000 years ago, along with northern Syria and Iraq, this region was the cradle of the ancient Aramean civilization. After the coming of Christ, it became the land of the Syrian Orthodox Christians. Nowadays, that presence has been largely lost in the annals of time.
Kafro, Bazibrin. Until the beginning of the 20th century, these were prosperous Christian villages. Now, they're ghost towns surrounded by abandoned fields. Fanatical persecution by the Kurdish people, influenced by short-sighted governments to carry out an insane policy of religious cleansing, has reduced arable land around the Christian communities of Tur Abdin to wasteland. Fortunately, today the Republic of Turkey has distanced itself from the Ottoman policy of yesteryear. The last Christian family to live here in the village of Urnus, now called Baglabasi, was massacred in 1992 by Muslim Kurds who had been promised their victims money and land in return. The 5th century church of St. Kyriakos is locked up. A Muslim woman keeps the key. village of Salah is the small 5th century monastery of St. Jacob, staffed by three monks and two nuns. Today, there are only two lay members in the Christian community that used to flourish around the tomb of the saint. We can't help but compare the decline of the Christian presence with the ruins not far from the monastery of the Persian Temple of Heracles that date back long before the coming of Christ. of the 8th century San Sobo in Ha is the Church of the Virgin Mary, whose origins go back to the early centuries of Christianity. Local traditions hold that the three wise men stopped here on their way to Bethlehem. Once a prosperous and bustling center of activity, it is now little more than a vantage point in what was formerly a Christian land. Einvardo was founded, like most places in the area, before the coming of Christ. One hundred years ago, it was an entirely Christian community. Today, the inhabitants are nearly all Muslim. Only eight Christian families remain. According to local tradition, this once wealthy town with several churches was saved by St. George at the time of the massacres of 1915, which decimated the Christians living on the high plateau of Turabdin. Many of the village's inhabitants are said to have seen the saint with their own eyes as he charged the aggressors on his horse, lance in hand. It's sad to note that until only a few years ago, local oppression and murderous fanaticism against the Christian community were still the order of the day. But while the memory of those tragic circumstances is still vivid, a ray of hope appears. A few Christians have decided to remain here, stubbornly eking out a precarious living in the firm belief that centuries of violence and murder belong definitively in the past. 
They are convinced that this mountain of the servants of God will soon, once again, be a flourishing seat of Christianity. They contribute to this dream by sending their children every day to the monastery to learn the language of their ancestors. Two nuns and their young pupils are the congregation of the 4th century monastery of Mor Melke, another outpost along the symbolic Christian defense line in the Turabdin Mountains. <laughs> Working the fields and tending the few domestic animals takes up much of the time of those who live in the surviving Syrian Orthodox monasteries. Like the inhabitants of any besieged fortress, they must be completely self-sufficient when it comes to the essentials, and their commitment itself becomes a form of prayer and dedication to the Lord. How many young martyrs have died here? But today, perhaps more than anywhere else, these children offer hope for tomorrow. Arkah is another semi-abandoned village in the Turabdin Hills. State-appointed teachers don't come here. This is Kurdish country, and people are afraid. This teacher is a volunteer sent by the bishop. Perhaps he too is afraid, but he has a mission to accomplish. The children are learning their language. They know that when they grow up, their mission will be to pass it on to future generations. The parish priest insists we join him for lunch at his home. His eldest daughter prepares typical local dishes and in our honor, the village Mukhtar joins the party. Among the pictures on the walls is a portrait of Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, perhaps a tribute to the man who was the first Turkish leader to advocate the separation of political power from any form of religious fundamentalism, thus indirectly helping the Christian cause. The parish priest of Keferze also invited us to his house. 
Another sign of hope for the future is that 15 Christian families and 15 Kurdish families live peacefully side by side in his village. This is why he sometimes has visitors with whom he speaks in Kurdish. Among the photographs and pictures on the walls is a portrait of a young bishop, the current patriarchal vicar of the Syrian Orthodox diocese in Germany. He was born in this village and was baptized by the same priest who offers us tea. <laughs> The church, dedicated to St. Ozozoel, dates back to the 5th century. As always, the congregation is made up almost exclusively of women, children, and elderly people. There is little to keep young people here, and inevitably, they can't wait to move away. There are still a few villages where the original ethnic identity is intact. In Bekuzione, now Bakizyan, the 120 to 130 inhabitants divided among 14 families are all Christians. 100 years ago, this was the norm in Turabdin. Today, it's a rarity. The village prepares for a celebration. In every house, women are busy cooking traditional dishes. Bread is made according to a centuries-old recipe using wheat flour ground with a mill that probably looks much the same as those used in Noah's time. The cross marked on the dough before it's placed in the oven is a sign of thanks to God for having provided the food, as well as a symbol of propitiation that he will continue to do so in the future. Easter eggs are decorated according to an age-old ritual. Fingers caress the fragile shells with traditional expertise. The eve of this celebration is no different to the eve of such celebrations anywhere else in the world. Unmarried women prepare to look their most attractive just in case there's a future husband at the party. The older women give advice and offer alternative solutions. In this age of discotheques, drugs, and extreme forms of entertainment, in which the so-called advanced societies celebrate consumerism and the satisfaction of every human whim on the collective altar, a party like this serves as a reminder that, in the words of Jesus, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Did 
Despite improved conditions for Christians in Turabdin, their survival has not received the all clear. Danger may still lurk in the embers of fanaticism that constantly smolder in this region. The Syrian Orthodox Church is the institution that champions the cause of the Aramean population and it does what it can. The role of protector and guardian is delegated to the parishes and to the few remaining monasteries, the real strongholds of Turabdin's Christian fabric. Ruins of monasteries that were active up until the turn of the 19th century are commonplace. Among the still functioning monasteries are two that are especially important. Deir ad Zafaran, the Safran Monastery, lies southeast of Mardin, the largest city in this Turkish province. The name comes from the color of the local stone. Built in 493 AD, Deir ad Zafaran was considered the citadel of the Aramean Christians of Turabdin. For almost 800 years, from 1160 to 1920, it was the seat of the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate that is now located in Damascus. Today, only two monks live here. With the help of a handful of lay volunteers, they run a school for orphans and tend to the religious needs of the local congregation. Our guide explains that more than 2,000 years ago, the oldest wing of the monastery was a temple to the sun god. Before BC, uh, BC 2000 years ago, and this is a window. So the sun, uh, raising the there was a window the here, facing inside. east, before and which pagans would gather to worship the rising sun. And this part is uh, for sacrifice, and people they give. Uh, In the sacrificial area, animals were offered to the sun god. More imp important seeming. These stone slabs are fitted together without the use of mortar or metal braces. They're approximately two meters high and simply fitted next to one another in six rows to the left and six rows to the right of a central row of keystones. They hold each other like that. These doors are 300 years old. The doors of the crypt that houses the tombs of the patriarchs are 300 years old. The church, with all its stucco work, ornamentation, furniture and altars, is the work of Aramean craftsmen. The Patriarch's throne used to be in Antioch. On the back, starting from the middle, are the names of all the Patriarchs that have succeeded each other through the centuries, from St. Peter to the present day. Three hundred years ago, these litters were used to take the Patriarchs on long pastoral journeys along the rough, often hostile roads of Turabdin. 
The altar of the Virgin Mary is a masterpiece of Aramean craftsmanship. It's entirely made of walnut wood, joined without nails or metal braces. At the foot of the altar is a fragment of the mosaic from the cave of St. Peter in Antioch that dates back 1,600 years. The time has come to say goodbye, but first, our host has something to show us before we leave. Look down in Syria, Damascus, Patriarch. And those were monasteries. Moria Virgin Mary, destroyed by the enemies of our faith because religion hatred. It's late. We have to get going if we want to arrive to Mor Gabriel before it's dark. All right, because when it comes dark, Mor Gabriel, doors closed. Right. Southeast of Midyat. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is the geographical and spiritual heart of the plateau and the safest place of refuge in the entire region. Founded in 397 AD, it's not only the oldest surviving Syrian Orthodox monastery in Turkey, but also the most active one. just in time. Every evening at sunset, the great iron doors are closed and will only be open again the following morning. Among the many activities here, the most important is the school. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is truly a bastion of Syriac tradition. Today, the walls, which in the course of the centuries have repelled armies and predators alike, serve to discourage those who would like to eliminate the very notion of Christianity in this region. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is the seat of the Archbishop Vicar of Turabdin, who has the heavy responsibility of keeping Syrian Orthodox Christianity alive in the land of its birth, and, when necessary, of offering the faithful a refuge in the monastery itself. But where is everybody? Oh yes, of course, today is Sunday. has recently been restored, a long but rewarding job carried out with scrupulous regard for the original architecture. 
This is especially true of the church that for years was used as a stable by Muslim hordes who showed no respect for the tombs of over 12,000 slain Christians. tombs, some mosaics, and the chapel of Mor Gabriel, the founder of the monastery, are all that survive of the original church. Renovation of the chapel included the narrow passageway through which the saint entered and left his cell to join his brothers or to pray in the chapel. We bade farewell to the tranquility of Mor Gabriel and set out on the long journey to Iraq, the third country that, along with Syria and Turkey, made up the Aramaeans' homeland. After overcoming a few unexpected bureaucratic problems, we arrived at the Marmatai Monastery in the region of Mosul. Renovation work is in full swing. Workers go about their business as we visit the chapel that houses the tombs of Marmatai and other saints. Among them is Gregorius Barebroio, who lived in the 13th century and is the most famous of all Syriac writers. Mar Banam is one of Iraq's most impressive monasteries. It was built on the site where, in around 382 AD, Prince Banam was murdered with his sister Sarah and 40 other Christians by order of his father, Sennacherib, Lord of Nimrod, who would not tolerate his children's conversion to the religion of Christ. The building is considered the finest medieval Christian monument in Iraq. The church was built in the 12th or 13th century and has two magnificent base reliefs, one of Mar Banam on horseback triumphing over the devil, the other of Saint Sarah being baptized. Copies have been incorporated into the facade in place of the vandalized originals. Behind the monastery, on the actual site of the massacre, is a mausoleum that houses the remains of the two saints and the faithful who died with them while praying for the forgiveness of their persecutors. Mm. 
In the Iraqi villages inhabited by Syriac Christians, many churches have been destroyed by the ravages of time. But as in Bartola, near Musum, many new places of worship and community activity have been built in recent years. The church of Mar Shmuni boasts a font that dates back to 1343. In Jerusalem, as we look over the rooftops and terraces on the slopes of the hill of Zion, our attention is drawn to the little bell tower of St. Mark's Monastery. The monastery can only be reached on foot after threading one's way through the maze of tiny streets and alleys of the Tower of David area. It was built on the ancient site of the evangelist's home, an inscription in medieval Syriac discovered in 1940 to the left of the main entrance to the monastery's church testifies to this. It reads, this is the house of Mary, mother of John called Mark, proclaimed Church of the Holy Apostles and named after the Virgin Mary, mother of God, following the ascension to heaven of our Lord Jesus Christ, restored after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in the year of the Lord 73. After the Syrian Orthodox Church lost its other churches and properties here in the Holy City, the monastery became, and still is, the archbishop's seat and center of Jerusalem's Syriac community. Tradition holds that this painting on leather of the Virgin and Child, of which a number of copies can be seen in many famous sanctuaries, is in fact a true portrait of Christ's mother, painted by Saint Luke. Syrian Orthodox Christians are also present in Bethlehem. This Syriac church stands beside the spot where tradition has it that the three wise men rested while following the star. Tradition also declares that it stands on the very site of the inn where Joseph and Mary failed to find room. Given Mary's impending labor, they were forced to take shelter in the grotto, which has now been incorporated into the nearby Basilica of the Nativity. The only way to reach the monastery of Mar Musa, or St. Moses the Ethiopian, is on foot. Those who make it this far are received with open arms regardless of their faith. People come here to spend a day, months, or even years in meditation, study, and prayer. wonder that the small resident community, a fine example of fraternal heterogeneity, is in a state of constant flux. An important Syrian Orthodox monastery for centuries, in the 19th century, Mar Musa changed hands and eventually fell into ruin. 
Now, run by the Italian Jesuit who is the power behind the renovation work, it's become a place of ecumenical hospitality to enhance the mutual understanding that embraces all Christians, no matter which confession they belong to, and to extend it to include Muslims and followers of other religions. Tradition says that the monastery was founded by an Ethiopian who traveled through Egypt and Palestine and settled in Syria, where he lived as a hermit and died a martyr. Marmousa's position makes it an impregnable fortress, but appearances can be deceiving. It's open to all people of goodwill who can make the long and arduous 800 meter climb. In the end, we had to use the community's special transportation for our camera equipment. The terrain around the monastery is barren and inhospitable, traversed by tracks that are as difficult as the proverbial path to heaven. Only four-footed climbers negotiate them with dexterity and arrogant indifference. Newly arrived guests are given the grand tour by the community's young priest. Down below, the desert stretches eastwards as far as the eye can see. Among the many interesting sites are the caves where the monks once lived. Rain collected in large cisterns was their only source of water. Some of the caves have been converted into cells to host guests. Recently, the number of visitors has been growing steadily and the construction of additional guest quarters is already underway. The monastery dates from the 4th century, but it took on its current shape in the 15th century when it became an important Syrian Orthodox synobium. In 1982, it was in a seemingly irreversible state of ruin. Rebuilding has been a long and difficult task financed by a school of restorers through a cooperative venture of Italian professors and local students. Most of the medieval frescoes have been saved and it's hoped that even more will be recovered in the future. Among the frescoes, a large last judgment occupies the entire west wall. Precious manuscripts, part of the heritage of the Syriac Christians, have also been saved and restored, as well as Arabic inscriptions in a Syriac context. Fine examples of the Arabization of the Aramean Christians in the 11th century, and of a profound and wholehearted Christian participation in Arab culture. In fact, small groups of Arab pre-Islamic Christians, the result of 14 centuries of side-by-side -side coexistence, are still today Christians within a church based on the Syriac culture. Thus, the renovated monastery now safeguards a historic, cultural, and spiritual heritage within the greater scheme of Christianity as a whole. Kera means coconut, and Kerala means land of coconuts. At the southernmost point of India, the Aramaic heritage of the Syrian Orthodox Church dates back to the time when Thomas the Apostle landed here to spread the gospel message.
It is a cultural and religious, not ethnic, heritage that has been passed down through the Church of Malankara, the Syrian Orthodox Church of Kerala, that recognizes the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch as its figurehead. In the monastery of Malekrus, near Cochin, we had our first meeting with four resident monks who live there with a few young students. Three monks, including the abbot, were educated in the seminary. The fourth is an ex-clerk of the Indian post office who, at the age of 40, felt the call of the Lord. He answered by giving up all his worldly goods and joining the monastery where he has been living for over 20 years. May you show mercy and blessings on this food, blessed in the name of the Holy Trinity, in the centuries of centuries. Amen. Listening to this grace said by a humble monk in the language that the biblical patriarchs used 4,000 years ago in their prayers to God, and that Jesus of Nazareth used 2,000 years ago is a moving experience. It's an invisible link that brings different places and moments in history together into a single religion. Emphasized by the discovery on distant shores of the living memory of the Aramaeans, a people that was born pagan and became a people of God. At the dawn of Christianity, in the fourth year after the ascension of Christ, 
Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, founded the first Christian church here in Antioch, modern-day Antakya. The first patriarchal seat of the Syrian Orthodox Church, directly descended from Peter's church, was therefore also in Antioch, where it remained until the year 518. The seat of the church was then moved to various monasteries of Mesopotamia. The last was Dera Zafiran, which remained the official seat of the Patriarchate for nearly 700 years, from 1293 until 1932. After a period of atrocious violence, particularly during and following World War I, in which 250,000 faithful lost their lives, the Patriarchate was transferred to various places in Syria. Since 1957, it has been in Damascus. Today, the spiritual head of the Syrian Orthodox Church continues to carry out his high apostolic mission from the capital of Syria, near the gate of Babtuma, one of the seven gates in the ancient walls of Damascus is the seat of the Patriarchate. The current Patriarch, His Holiness Moran Mor Ignatius Zaka I, is 122nd in a line that starts with St. Peter. A half hour drive north of Damascus is the great seminary of St. Ephraim, whose impressive buildings were officially opened in 1966. Although the style is modern, this and other recent church buildings often contain elements inspired by traditional Syriac architecture and style. One example of this is the new monastery of St. Mary near Hasake in eastern Syria. It has only recently been finished. A spontaneous act of reverence by a passing van driver honored the sanctity of this new monastery that was still not inaugurated at the time. The language of the Syrian Orthodox Church is Syriac. Along with Palmyrene, Nabataean, Mandaic, and the Jewish Aramaic dialects, Syriac is the legacy of Aramaic, the language of Jesus and the Apostles. A legacy that is cherished in these manuscripts of the past, some of which have had a hazardous and troubled history. So much so, that it's a sheer miracle that a part of these, some of them 15 centuries old, have reached our own times. In 1559, a large number of Syriac manuscripts were burned in India in the presence of the members of the Jamper Synod, a move that aimed to stamp out many of the local Syriac Christian traditions. 10,000 Middle Eastern manuscripts were lost in 1715 when the ship that was carrying them to the Vatican sank. Perhaps these are among the reasons why in the Syrian Orthodox Church of today, patient hands continue to copy these precious writings. The painstaking labor of a scribe from ages past. It took more than 340 hours to copy the Peshitta, the Syriac text of the Bible. A veritable labor of love.
Here in the cave church of St. Peter in Antioch, the final liturgical ceremony of a synod of Syrian Orthodox bishops is being held. The synod is attended by the patriarch and the archbishops and metropolitans of the 27 dioceses into which the church is divided. In turn, the dioceses gather together some five million faithful scattered throughout the Middle East, India and the rest of the world as a result of the diaspora that has taken place due above all to the need to escape from fanaticism and oppression in several of the home countries. solemn ceremony is over. The patriarch and the bishops receive the respects of Christians who have come from all over the world to attend this rare event. Visitors include a group that perform folk dances from the host country. to the mid-20th century, thousands of Syrian Orthodox Christians emigrated to North and South America, Europe, and to Australia. An all-too-brief visit to some of the communities of the diaspora takes us to the United States of America, to New York, New Jersey, California, in particular, Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon. These are the cities and states that host substantial centers of Syrian Orthodox Christians. Although well integrated into local society, they are proud of their origins and traditions and fiercely committed to preserving their language, celebrating their rituals, and organizing gatherings in order to safeguard the common bond represented by their faith. And the most vulnerable of all their possessions, their identity.
be a mockery if, after escaping near annihilation in its countries of origin, this people were to succumb to the different customs of their host countries and a higher standard of living that could dull or even wipe out altogether an age-old cultural identity. The Syrian Orthodox Church and its lay associations work hard to make sure that will never happen. The religious communities are subordinate, through their bishops, to the authority of the patriarch, but the lay communities are independently organized and sponsor meetings and rallies born of individual and collective initiatives. Syriac cultural associations and lay communities are grouped into federations, which in turn belong to an organization that unites and represents them all, the SUA, the Syriac Universal Alliance. The SUA was established on July 16, 1963, in New Jersey by the Syrian National Federation in Sweden and the American Aramean Associations. The founders' goals were to have an international organization able to protect the rights of Syrian Aramean individuals and the Syrian Aramean community all over the world, to preserve the language and Aramean traditions and heritage, and to instill in Syrian Arameans the consciousness of their identity and roots, as well as to ensure their freedom and equality on a par with other peoples and nations. In Los Angeles, the Diocese of St. Ephraim, along with the parish of St. George and other parishes, is the driving force behind various social, cultural, and religious programs. Portland, Oregon. The Church of St. Ignatius in the Northern Archdiocese hosted Convention 2000, which brought together the guest of honor, the Archbishop of the Holy Land and Jordan, the Archbishops and highest members of the American clergy, numerous faithful, and the Patriarch who presided over the convention. The program called for a series of educational, cultural, and social events. The theme of the convention was a phrase from St. Paul's letters to the Hebrews in which he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The convention featured many speakers, debates, concerts, and the closing celebration of the divine liturgy by the patriarch. A lively open-air lunch with a menu of traditional dishes from the mother countries helped to consolidate the feeling of fraternity and cordiality that embraced everyone present, clergy and lay members alike. A boat trip on the Columbia River, during which the patriarch, the bishops, and the faithful enjoyed themselves together like old friends, 
provided a fitting finale for the Portland Convention 2000. Montreal, Canada. Monuments, quaint neighborhoods, flashy storefronts, bustling tourist spots, and the many other attractions in this cosmopolitan city would seem to make it an unlikely place to find traces of the Syrian Orthodox religion. Nevertheless, not far from Notre Dame Cathedral, there is more than one Syriac church here. On this site, the diocese's new community center will soon be built. The community holds a meeting to discuss how to get the most out of the new complex that will include a church and various social and recreational facilities. Most of the Syriac Christians in this community come from Lebanon, and many of them are in the restaurant business. The Cedar of Lebanon, the national symbol of their country of origin, stands side by side with signs advertising kebabs. Back in Europe, at Art Goldau, on Lake Zugersee, near Lake Lucerne. Here, an old Franciscan monastery, bought and restored by the Archdiocese of Central Europe, has become the main monastery and point of reference for all the Syriac people who have settled in the cantons of the Swiss Confederation. The Patriarch came in person to consecrate the church. The ceremony is followed by a procession to the Catholic parish, graciously lent for the occasion since the monastery's church was too small to hold such a large congregation. Gathering around a communal table, sharing typical ethnic foods, is a treasured ritual for the Syriac people.
I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In another Swiss church, a baptism celebrated according to the rigorous Syriac ritual welcomes Marcus Jakub Halef into the community. In Siebnen, in the canton of Schwitz, the president of the Association for Syro-Aramaic Culture commemorates the memory of the famous Archbishop Philoxenus Johannum Dolabani, who died in 1969. An orator, translator, poet, and author of more than 70 books, the Archbishop was a shining example for Syrian Christians of his generation and remains so for those who remember and revere him today. Our visit to the German diocese begins in Frankfurt on Main. Once part of the Central European diocese, this diocese has been independent since 1997 and is now one of the most important in Europe. Our first meeting with them takes place, naturally, in one of the many Syrian Orthodox churches. Living in Germany today are more than 55,000 Syrian Orthodox Arameans, most of whom are originally from Turabdin, with some 3,000 from Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. Forty-three parishes run 60 places of worship, 22 of which are newly built churches. The Church of St. Gabriel in Kirkart, with its fine architecture, its icons, and its frescoes, is famous as the most beautiful Syrian Orthodox Church in Europe. In the front row of St. Gabriel's congregation is a white-bearded senior citizen, whom we discover was parish priest here for 12 years. Later, we visit him in his home, where we find him intent on the work he enjoys most the careful, patient copying in beautiful calligraphy of theological and liturgical books. He then sees to their binding, following the ancient traditions of the old monasteries. A prolific author in his own right, he's dedicated almost his entire life to this work, along with his many duties as a priest. In Warburg, at the monastery of Moor Jacob of Zrug, the seat of the diocese, we meet the patriarchal vicar of Germany while he presides at a meeting of his seminarians. As in all the countries of the diaspora, Syriac Christians in Germany are represented by two basic entities, the Syrian Orthodox Church and the Lay Federation of Arameans. The federation was begun in 1985 by forming a first group of 10 Aramean cultural associations. There are now 40 of these groups. The Federation, independent of all political parties, represents the Aramean people in Germany and is charged with caring for the cultural, social and political needs of the Syriac Aramean community. Among its main activities is the publication of a magazine entitled Mardutho de Suryoye, Aramean Culture, which provides its readers with news and information of interest to their particular sensibilities. They also promote and organize events which may be cultural, recreational, or have to do with community welfare. These events create the opportunity for the Aramean people to gather together and to strengthen the bonds of mutual understanding and solidarity in the spirit of their oldest, most cherished traditions. I'm gonna go 
Every now and then, there's a really special occasion, such as this consecration of a new church in Augsburg near Munich, performed by the patriarch, ever ready to come to the call of his flock wherever and whenever it needs him. Every new event of this kind is another milestone along the road this community is following through the modern world. In Holland, the Church of Our Lady in Amsterdam welcomes us to the Archdiocese of Central Europe. St. Johannes was the first Syrian Orthodox Church to be built in Holland. It looks more like a house than a church, but it has given birth to many others. St. Mary's, St. Jacob's, St. Kuriakos, and more Ignatius where we attended Sunday Mass, celebrated by the Archbishop. After Mass, we received a peremptory invitation to visit the Monastery of St. Ephraim near Hengelo, the seat of the Archbishop. The tranquility that pervades the monastery has a pleasing effect on the soul. The diocese has its own cemetery, where members of the community can now find eternal rest in their own land, as if they had returned to their homes in the mountains of Turabdin and the villages of Syria. The Federation of Syriac Christian Organizations of Holland is a cornerstone of the Aramean social fabric. It keeps abreast of the progress made by members, many of whom have become prominent citizens in their Dutch communities. Syro Arameans are active in import export and industry. as well as in textiles and clothing manufacturing. Some are artisans who have brought with them skills learned in their countries of origin. Others are in the restaurant and catering business, in which they have achieved significant success. One Syriac community member runs a driving school. And another is the only Syriac female business executive. She runs an insurance agency.
However, the community's songs and music remain the same as those played in the villages of Syria, Lebanon, Turkey and Iraq. And traditional rituals and terms of endearment are the same as those used in any Syriac church or family in its country of origin. Sweden. Syriac immigrants in Sweden are businessmen, restaurateurs, and artisans. In general, most of these people have done well in the diaspora. They have drawn on their long tradition in the fields of employment and commerce, successfully establishing themselves in their adopted societies. But they have not forgotten who they are and where they come from. Most of all, they have not forgotten the language of their forefathers. This professional photographer is talking in Syriac to a customer, a fellow Aramean, living proof of the community's pride in its cultural heritage. <laughs> The Syriac Christians in Sweden are represented in a number of different churches the Eastern Syriac Church, the Syriac branch of the Melkite Church, the Syriac Maronite Church, the Chaldean Church, the Syriac Catholic Church, the Protestant Churches, and of course, the Syrian Orthodox Church, where most of the faithful congregate. <laughs> The Syrian Orthodox Church is organized in two separate dioceses, the Diocese of Sweden, led by the Patriarchal Bishop Vicar, and the Diocese of Sweden and Scandinavia, under the direction of another Metropolitan Bishop. Altogether, 
the Syrian Orthodox Christians in Sweden total more than 40,000. The Syrian Orthodox Church in Sweden has a very active, well-organized lay organization that is one of the most efficient Syriac federations in the world. The lay commitment is very strong. With the church's support, it promotes social and cultural activities that serve to unite the entire community and to stimulate exchange and collaboration between the different countries of the diaspora. By providing more in-depth understanding of the history of the Aramean people, it aims to ensure that the Syriac Christians scattered throughout the world will not lose their identity or their cultural heritage to the material affluence and religious agnosticism that increasingly characterize the wealthy societies which these Christians have joined. Sports-related activities are also used to promote the community's social and cultural well-being. The Syriac Federation's soccer team is among the top teams in Sweden's second division. Along with sporting activities, the Syriac Youth Federation, founded in 1992 and one of the initiators of SIEC, Syrian Aramean European Youth, is now one of the largest youth organizations in Sweden, with 30 member associations and almost 10,000 members. Its main aims are to give Syrian youth a platform to safeguard their cultural identity and background and help them integrate into the society of their host country without losing their traditional values. We're in the offices of the Syriac Federation in Sweden where we visit the staff of Bahro Suryoyo, the Syriac Aramean Light, an independent magazine founded in Sweden in 1979. This publication follows the most important Syriac Aramean activities in Sweden and in the rest of the world. Bahro Suryoyo comes out 11 times a year and contains news and information of all kinds, including articles dealing with history, culture, sports, politics, and economics. It's written in five languages, Swedish, English, Turkish, Arabic, and in Syriac Aramean. The magazine has around 1,500 subscribers, but its circulation among individuals, families, schools, libraries, and various institutions totals between 40 and 50,000. Bahro Suryoyo is the voice of the Syriac Aramean people scattered all over the world. The Syriac people in Sweden are mainly refugees from Turabdin, the region that suffered more persecutions and massacres than any other. At the Federation's headquarters, a painfully simple rendition of those events by a popular artist serves as a tragic reminder.
India deserves its own chapter, or rather Kerala, the southernmost tip of the subcontinent where the Syriac Christian community flourishes in numerous branches. According to local tradition, St. Thomas landed here in 52 AD, founding the first Christian community. In the first century AD, there was a considerable amount of trade between South India and the Roman Empire. Therefore, such an early arrival of Christianity in South India is perfectly plausible. At various later times, in the mid-fourth century and in the ninth century, there are records of the arrival of Syriac Christians from the Middle East. The first were 72 families from Edessa in 354 AD. Today, there are as many as eight different churches which are heirs to the Syriac tradition. One of the largest of these is the Syrian Orthodox Church of Malankara, Malankara being an older name for Kerala, with some two million faithful, having the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch as their supreme spiritual authority. The stories of St. Thomas, depicted in many of the churches dedicated to him, tell of his arrival in India, of his preaching, and of his martyrdom, which links the church of Malankara to the martyrs of all Christian churches. Syriac inscriptions often report details of important events in local history. It's important to emphasize that faith in Christ, passed down for 2,000 years from father to son, has not erased the host country's local traditions and customs. On the contrary, many have been absorbed and integrated into the church's rituals as spontaneous prayers and a sign of the people's true devotion.
St. Mary at Kothamangalam is the oldest church in Kerala. Following centuries of renovation and rebuilding, today's church bears almost no sign of the original 4th and 5th century building. All that remains is this stone inscribed with ancient Aramaic writing and the frescoes behind the main altar. Syriac origins, however, are clearly visible in this painting and in other details. This church has a congregation of 1,000 families and is considered the cathedral of the Diocese of Angamali. Angamali's 400,000 members make it the world's largest Syriac community. There are 625 parish churches in Kerala, grouped into 11 dioceses. This is the Church of St. Mary at Tiripunitra. This church, looking out over a river, is St. Mary's in Piravon. Tradition has it that it was founded by one of the three wise men, or more specifically, by the Black King when he returned here from Bethlehem after visiting the Christ Child. Originally, it was dedicated to the three kings, but since the Orthodox faith does not allow such unorthodox dedications, it was renamed the Church of St. Mary. Nevertheless, popular belief still insists on invoking the three kings. For this reason, tens of thousands of pilgrims, up to 75,000 on Easter Day alone, come here from all over Kerala. Among them, there are many Hindus. St. Mary's at Angamali is over 1,000 years old. There are several important paintings here, one of which depicts St. Thomas being presented as an architect to a powerful merchant. Others refer to the life and passion of Jesus. On the southern side, there is a last judgment. In the past, this was the mother church of Kerala. That's why it houses many tombs of bishops and why the leader of the Syriac Church in India, with the title Archdeacon, is buried here. The church of Mor Sabor and Mor Afrot at Akaparambu is even older. These two holy men and fathers of the church came to Kerala in 822 and built the church in 825, after the immigration of the 72 families from Edessa in 345. Their arrival heralded the second migratory wave of Syriac Christians from the Syriac linguistic area. The two saints then went on to found many other churches in Kerala that were known as Kadisha churches, from the Syriac word meaning saint or churches of saints. The main altar with a long inscription in Syriac is dedicated to the two founders of the church, Mor, Sabor, and Afrot. St. George's at Karingachira is one of the oldest churches in Kerala. Founded in the 8th century, it has since been rebuilt several times. The church, famous throughout Kerala, benefited from the patronage of the Maharaja of Cochin and is the church of a congregation scattered in a radius of many kilometers. Many bishops are buried in the church of St. Thomas at Mulanturudi, making it a revered place of worship. In the past, the most important Syrian Orthodox Church meetings were held here.
The holy oil, or myron, has been consecrated twice. The consecration of the holy myron is an event of utmost significance for the Syrian Orthodox Church, and it can only be carried out by the Patriarch. St. George's at Perumpili is a modern church under the direct jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Antioch. Many miracles have taken place here. The Church of St. Mary at Kurupumpadi is the largest parish in Kerala. About 3,000 families belong to this congregation. The painting of the Virgin on the main altar is 800 years old. The baptismal font, carved from a block of granite, as is often the case in churches here, is splendidly decorated with curious sculptures inspired by Hindu mythology. In the 19th century, the Diocese of Kandanadu was born. This was its cathedral. The first church was built in the 8th century and was rebuilt in the 14th century. The little cemetery bears Syriac inscriptions. Inside are the tombs of bishops, founding fathers and patrons. Among them, Mor Toma IV, who is the head of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India. In 1685, the Patriarch of Antioch sent Bishop Yeldo Mor Baselios to take over the Church of St. Thomas at Kotamangalam, founded in 1455. Twelve days after his arrival, the bishop died. But before he passed away, he appointed bishop a monk who had accompanied him. Yeldo Mor Baselios is considered a saint. Flocks of pilgrims come here from all over Kerala to worship at his tomb and to ask for his mercy and blessing. It's a veritable feat of organization to cook food in such great quantities for free distribution to the pilgrims. Every Saturday, many families come here to baptize their children, who, often in honor of Yeldo Marbazelios, are christened Yeldo. Elephants, the symbol of Kerala, often participate in celebrations at the sanctuary. Although this quick overview aims to give only an idea of the vitality of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Malankara, we cannot omit the Theological Seminary of Vetikal, near Cochin, the main port of Kerala. This is one of the most important institutions run by the Syrian Orthodox Church in all of India. Modern facilities and a wide range of teaching ensure that graduates from here will have received an excellent preparation to meet the religious mission that awaits most of them. Lesson number 10 about work. Or common, or common, com, com, or common, or common, com, tun, com, tun, com, ten, com, ten, com, in, com, in, or com, net, or com, net. The printing press and adjacent library, looked after by nuns who are part of the seminary's community, are an irreplaceable support system for teachers and students, and supply parishes with books, pamphlets, educational material and indispensable tools for carrying out acts of evangelization and religious instruction on a vast scale.
The seminary in Vetikal, with the seminary of the Diocese of Knanaya and the St. Ephraim Ecumenical Research Institute in Kotayam, is a fundamental institution of Syriac culture and tradition in India, and is among the most efficient and respected in the world. Collective prayer in the liturgical language of the Syrian Orthodox Church is the source that fills all the students, teachers and any other people in the seminary with positive energy. This child doesn't speak Syriac, yet. Probably he will learn it as he grows up and will go into a church to pray with other members of the community. At this age, it's up to his parents and relatives to bring him to church, and they do so joyfully. They're aware of the importance of this day for their little boy. Soon, in the church of St. Thomas at Kotamangalam, he and many others will be introduced to the faith of Christ according to the traditions of their forefathers. This Saturday, we'll see the baptism of at least 100 children. There is little reason to be surprised. The Indians are prolific, and many of them want to baptize their children in the church where the bishop who came from Antioch, Yeldo Morbaselius, is buried. That's why every Saturday, this place is thronged with people, creating a kaleidoscope of images and a cacophony of sound.
knows how many of the little boys who have been brought here to be baptized today will go home bearing the name of the holy bishop, Yeldo.